Good morning, my friends. Uh, back here in dialogue with you, conversation with you. I'm going to expand on our conversation on unraveling what we call <clears throat> fundamental reality. <clears throat> Why is that important? Is it important? So um, today's topic is going to be about um, upgrading the software in consciousness that uh, creates the experience of uh, everyday reality. The experience of everyday reality. And how to actually um, become the director, the producer, the choreographer, the hero, the heroine of um, your own movie that you call life. So uh, I know in various ways I've um, discussed this with you, but if you like the idea, then uh, please uh, press the like button. Let me know. Elvira from Romania, thank you. Uh, Malu, uh, thank you, good morning. Jeanette uh, Bender, thank you. Michael Pishi, Pihi, thank you. Vivian Lee, thank you. From Malaysia, wow. Um, Miguel, thank you. Leah, Lisa Ray, Giovanni, <laughs> says rebooting our consciousness. I like that. Rebooting, upgrading the illusion. I really like that. So, Today's topic is about our journey together, your journey, my journey, and our journey together through the illusion of cosmic time. <clears throat> so, if this topic interests you, let me know. And if it doesn't, then um, see you next time. And I'm here almost every day. So. Hopefully, we will uh, speak about something that does interest you. In the meanwhile, if it does interest you, then please invite your friends, please give me your feedback, please criticize, condemn, or uh, whatever else you feel like doing so that we can expand our conversation and we can also expand our awareness and expand our capacity for creativity and insight and intuition and imagination and ultimately um, realize that everything that we call reality is subject to revision. Everything that we call reality is subject to revision. But first we, we must explore it and explore it together, we must, because your feedback gives me <clears throat> um, new ideas and also is good to see, um, you know, that I can also question some of my habitual assumptions and habitual certainties. So great, Abongchil in South Africa. Wow. Um, Marlene says that she was pondering the subject, so it's a good idea. Um, Jefferson says, Kali is time, we must honor her. Yes, the goddess of time. She's also, in a way, the goddess of illusion. They're all goddesses of illusion. Okay, Lisa says, important topic. Um, so why don't we actually um, go for it? Uh, we're almost 700 people here, so please let me know if you should go for it. Rajaram uh, Silwal, hello from Kathmandu. Hello from Kathmandu. Ruth Venki Haga from Norway. Hi, Ruth. So... Lynn says, so what do you take on the idea that we wrote this entire science? Yes, we did. <sighs> Revision of reality. Every day, reality is subject to revision. 
Shall I start? Shall we start? Or shall we wait? We're up to almost 800 people. 1,000 is a good number for us to create the field of awareness in which we experience reality. Shari uh, says, want to explore my soul deeper. We will right in a couple of minutes. Dana, ready to hear. Good Dana. Okay. So let's talk about it. how we recycle existence. We are existence, recycling and evolving. We are awareness of existence, recycling and evolving. Okay. So the first thing, I'm going to start now. <clears throat> so first thing to recognize is that uh, our perceptual experience of the world is um, totally unreliable, totally unreliable. Our perceptual experience of the world is um, creating an illusion. So let's examine just that one concept, okay? Your senses tell you that the earth is flat. Uh, so you can walk on it, <clears throat> but you know it's not true. The earth is spinning at dizzying speeds and hurtling through space at thousands of miles an hour. Your senses tell you um, that um, objects are solid. And we now know that they're proportionately as void as intergalactic space. So if you see the world through the models, the models, and we see the world through models, going back to my favorite poem of, uh, one of my favorite poems of William Blake, we are led to believe a lie when we see with and not through the eye that was born in the night to perish in the night while the soul slept in beams of light. So when we look through the eye, we go beyond the conditioned mind. But when we see with the eye, then we create a perceptual illusion. The earth is flat, the ground is stationary, things are solid. When we know that everything that we experience as the physical world, including our changing physical body, is in fact proportionately as void as intergalactic space. And seen through those eyes, through that conditioning, we actually understand that if we could see the world as it really is, we would see a huge emptiness with a few scattered dots and spots and some random electrical discharges. And if we understood exactly what is happening through the eyes or the models of that physicist or mathematician or theoretical physicist or quantum being, then we would see not only is everything that we look at, including our body, proportionately as void as intergalactic space, but those few random spots and dots that appear and disappear in this infinite void are also made of the same emptiness. Also made of the same emptiness. So no one now doubts whatever their model is, quantum vacuum, eternal inflation, cosmic inflation, super string theories, uh, multiverses, infinite universes, doesn't matter what your model is, but um, everybody agrees that fundamental reality is formless. Formless, and therefore infinite. So many years ago, I actually 
I actually uh, edited a book, something called Cosmos and Consciousness, where I actually ended up asking theoretical physicists if there was one thing they could agree on, because, you know, as you know, that uh, quantum mechanics is an excellent recipe for calculations that make technology possible, including the technology we are using right now. But I did ask them, since there are almost uh, um, 25 different um, interpretations of the mathematics of quantum mechanics, I asked um, them, these hundred or so theoretical physicists, if there was one thing that they would all agree on, only one thing, even though they had different models of uh, quantum mechanics. And uh, they did agree on that one thing. And um, that one thing was that all borders, all borders, you know what a border is, the border between my skin and my clothes, the border between the table and the floor, the legs of the table and the floor, everything that we see has a border. And um, the one thing that um, all scientists agreed on um, was that fundamental reality is boundaryless. A border is a boundary, okay? Fundamental reality is boundaryless. Whatever it is, it has no boundaries. And this is a deep understanding of uh, what we call reality, without which right now, this understanding, this technology that we're using right now, wouldn't be possible. My communication um, with you right now transcends um, national boundaries. My communication with you um, transcends um, any boundary right now, except, of course, the, the concept that we have of space-time and causality. But in fact, this communication is happening because fundamental reality has no boundaries. It is boundary-less, formless. Therefore, it is infinite. Therefore, it can't be seen. Only things with boundaries can be seen. Nor can it be touched because only objects with boundaries can be touched. Okay? Fundamental reality is not observable. Um, fundamental reality is not a perceptual experience. So whatever that fundamental reality is, it cannot be perceived and nor can it be conceptualized other than through mathematical equations that include a symbol called infinity and also include a symbol called zero. Okay? So, once again, fundamental reality is boundaryless. Everybody agrees on that. It has no borders. And only things with borders can be seen or experienced perceptually. In other words, perceptually, you cannot experience reality. There may be a reason for this, and the reason, of course, is that what we call fundamental is not perceptual or conceivable, and yet it is always the perceiver and conceptualizer. Another topic. But right now, let's say, one thing, fundamental reality is formless, is boundless, no boundaries, no borders, infinite, and uh, the source of every experience of a boundary, every experience of a boundary. And so those boundaries are 
ultimately, and this is also some what my physicist friends agree, those boundaries are notional. They are a notion, and that notion then structures the perception. The notion of a boundary structures the perception of a boundary. And in human beings, that notion is encapsulated in a word, in a word, hand, nose, glasses, hair, ears, book. See, these are words that refer to boundaries. And, and visually, the boundary here is a color, a shape, a form. And the pictures in there are also colors, shapes, and forms. And the border that you see between this and this is a border of color. And so, too, what you see here as face, etc., is a border of color. The word face, the word brain, the word uh, book refers to a boundary, a form, <clears throat> given appearance by shapes and colors. That's it. So the form is the boundary created by entanglement of colors and shapes. <clears throat> and the object described is described by a word. The word encamp encapsulates the entanglement of colors that we call this book visually. But the same principles apply for our other senses as well. Same principles. Okay, so the word is actually the flesh in terms of uh, uh, creating the notion of objects. The notion of objects creates the experience of objects, at least in human beings. Okay, we know that. So you have two entangled pictures, old woman, young woman, but actually they're an entanglement of colors. And if you um, use the word, I'm seeing an old, or expression, I'm seeing the old woman, then that entanglement of colors, given meaning, becomes that image. If you see the same painting, there are many examples of this, a superimposition of colors that give rise to different pictures in human consciousness based on the meaning or word we use to describe the entanglement of colors. Even our experience of um, space-time is a notion and it comes from uh, the construction of stereoscopic vision. Right now, um, if you see depth, you know, wherever you're sitting in your room, you have your computer in front of you, you have a handheld device, Ramanan, Namaste. So stereoscopic vision is also a construction. It's a construction um, based on meaning imbued into an entanglement of visual colors. You create stereoscopic vision. You create that. Just like you create uh, language out of noise and out of squiggles on a piece of paper. We create that. And then once we create that language, create that construct, it unleashes an entanglement of shapes, colors, forms, sensations, images, feelings, thoughts, all entanglement that structure the experience of physical objects and biological organisms in a theater of space-time and causality. And what I'm saying is the whole thing is an illusion, including your body-mind, which is part of the theater of space-time 
and causality with objects and other sentient beings that we refer to as um, biological organisms with their own set of or their own bandwidth of perceptual activity which shapes their experience illusory experience of the world just like the earth is flat is an illusion just like the ground is stationary is an illusion it's not stationary it's spinning at dizzying speeds and hurtling through space at thousands of miles an hour just like solid objects are an illusion so is your body and the rest of everything that we call the universe from atom to galaxy and multiple galaxies and infinite universes so what is it that is recycling and evolving in the notion of cosmic time as what we call the experience of life what is it that is recycling and evolving and to what purpose? We are entangled in a web of illusions. And every bit of the illusion actually reflects all of the illusion. Mejanj Dia says holographic reality. Yeah, you could call it that, holographic reality. The whole represented in every point. The universe represented in every point. William Blake hold eternity in an hour or something, you know, to see the universe in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower, hold eternity in the palm of your hand, etc., etc. But to what purpose? What is the recycling of illusions, including the recycling of the illusion of the body, mind and universe up to as it evolves? And the only thing I can think of is um, waking up from the illusion to that which is manufacturing these illusions. Waking up from the dream to that which is dreaming. And so to what purpose is that? Why wake up? Well, when you ultimately wake up, finally, both not only intellectually, because the intellect is the problem, but experientially, when you wake up from all illusions and recognize yourself as the infinite formless, then you are ready to upgrade the illusion of course, right now we have downgraded the illusion because the illusion says climate change, extinction of species, extinction of ourselves, war, terrorism, poison in the food chain, cyber hacking, nuclear weapons, biological warfare. Boy, the dream has become a nightmare. Downgraded the illusion altogether. But we can upgrade it, you know. My iPhone, for example, has an automatic device that um, periodically shuts off and then it downloads new software and says upgrade. Okay, so that's what our death is as well. Our death is um, the incubation that we need to... Uh, upgrade the illusion uh, and we keep upgrading it um, through um, labels that we give to images feelings thoughts perceptions fundamentally just sensation a sensation encapsulates every entangled experience is a sensation okay so we keep upgrading it and then ultimately we transcend all illusions to know that we are the creator of illusions and being formless and infinite and dimensionless and therefore having infinite dimensions all embedded 
is the key to morphing our experience of reality to infinite forms and phenomena. It's actually already happening, but it is happening uh, automatically so that um, the recycling of illusion, which is also called karma, uh, happens automatically and only occasionally after uh, death um, is there a slight upgrade. <laughs> but we can do a quantum upgrade, so it means totally destroy deconstruct the previous illusion into formlessness and then open the door to infinite softwares, upgrades, and continue upgrading till you realize that actually now you have a choice which is total freedom from identifying these upgrades and um, then knowing that once you stop identifying with the upgrades, then you can take quantum upgrades, which means complete destruction or deconstruction of the old illusion, complete death, and then reconstruction of a new illusion, which has nothing to do with the previous illusion. That's a quantum upgrade. New context, new meaning, new relationship or new interpretation of relationship and therefore new story. So all the upgrade is involving is the death and resurrection, the death of an old story and the resurrection of a new story. And the new story has nothing to do with the previous story. That's what quantum means. It's a discontinuity. The old doesn't exist. The new is born. Quantum agree. So what does this say about our identity? What does this say about our identity? Every identity is actually provisional. Every identity in space-time is provisional because space-time itself is part of the illusion. Space-time itself is part of the illusion. So, transcending all illusions gives you the freedom to create illusions that have never been imagined before. Okay, imagine a flying horse. Well, it's been imagined before. Imagine a giant mosquito bigger than an elephant. You can imagine that? Well, then it is part of your consciousness. Okay, remember that um, poem of Rumi? When I die, I will soar with angels, but when I die to the angels, what I shall become, you cannot imagine. Because imagination takes off from a previous imagined reality. A previous imagined reality. There are colors you and I cannot imagine because we don't have the biological instrument to experience those colors. Insects and honeybees and other uh, species of consciousness or, or um, other species of consciousness that we refer to as biological organisms, sentient beings, they experience colors you and I can't imagine. And not having experienced those colors, even our imagination needs a total death and resurrection. A new story. That's all it is. To be human is to have a story. To be human is to actually also be able to express that story in words, in language. So language doesn't describe, it constructs the story. And the story constructs the perceptual experience of reality. 
and then there is a deeper knowing of reality. So a perceptual experience of reality, solid world, space-time, objects, biological organisms moving around. Then there is, um, there is another uh, knowing, maybe a scientific knowing or maybe a spiritual knowing, which says um, actually reality is not what we perceive, but uh, that which is perceiving. Uh, reality is not that which we think, but that which is thinking. Reality is not that we imagine, but um, that uh, which is imagining. So several of you have said, what is the reality we need right now that we need to imagine because we have become the imagination of ourselves as this uh, biological organism hell-bent on extinction the um, the reality we need to imagine together today and become collectively critical mass is a more peaceful just sustainable healthier and joyful world but we can't stop there okay we cannot stop there we have to go beyond to realms of imagination that we have never experienced we have to understand that as we, as we expand our awareness of our own being, that we have access to infinite realities. And we have to understand one more thing, and that is consciousness is fundamentally free of its creations. Consciousness is fundamentally free of its constructs. Consciousness is fundamentally free of its stories, which then influence perception and cognition, which we call everyday reality. Consciousness knowing its creation, being aware of its creation, is fundamentally free of its creations. So consciousness therefore must be most alive on death because at that moment and post death it is fundamentally free of its imagination and therefore free to imagine something totally new, totally in freedom. All you have to know is that you have conceived, constructed, governed, and become modes of knowing and experience in existence. But you are not those modes of knowing and experience. You are the knower. And the knower is infinite only when it knows it is fundamentally free of its conceptions. This is um, today's conversation. <sighs> knowing that you're free of your creations, knowing that you construct your experiences, knowing that you become your experiences, knowing that you can choose your experiences, knowing that you can even choose the interpretation of those experiences. That's all. Know yourself as the knower and then go beyond the knower and ask yourself, what is it that knows the knower? And that is a non-conceptualizable awareness that is knower, knowing and known. That is observer, observing and observed. That is seer, seeing, and scenery. That's all. So, who are you? What are you? Well, at the moment, you're the infinite being playing the role of a person. All the world is a stage where every one must play a part. So, let me play the fool. 
with mirth and laughter, let old wrinkles come. I'm quoting Shakespeare, of course. And let my liver rather heat with wine, the wine, the intoxication of spirit, not spirits, the intoxication of spirits, than my heart cool with mortifying groans. Reality is a trick trickster. Only by playing the fool can you find yourself. Thank you.